Hey, what's up, guys? How you doing? Hope that you're having a great day, a great start to your week. It's been uh, it's been a while since we've talked. Huh? We've got a lot to catch up on. This is episode 370 of the Neutral Corner. I am your host, Michael Montero. Of course, it's Montero Unboxing. Before I get into it, guys, uh, just a reminder, as always, make sure you're subscribed. Click that notification bell here on YouTube if you're watching live. I'm going live simultaneously on Twitter and Facebook. I don't know how much longer I'm going to go on Facebook. I don't even know how much longer I'm going to keep Facebook. I, I use it less and less and less, but definitely on YouTube and X, we'll, we'll keep it going live. Um, so let me know what you guys think about that. Should I should I just cut Facebook because I'm like this close to just deleting it? I don't really use it much anymore. Anyway, um, make sure you're subscribed and make sure you pay the fee, non-monetary. All I ask is that you guys spread the word about the show. All right. Just share it on your social media. Let people out there know about it. That's it. It's pretty easy. Uh, before I get into um, my review, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to preview a lot of stuff today. There's not a whole lot to review, but there's a lot of things to preview. Some good, some bad. Um, the month of May, really, really good. We'll talk about that. Before I get into it, though, I want to share my screen, uh, show you guys something real quick. So I haven't been writing for a while because, you know, I've, I've had kids and um, I've been living as a fighter and a father and, and that has just taken all of my time. But I was able to finally squeeze in some time recently to do a, a pet project for the Ring Magazine that uh, it's something I've wanted to do for a while and do a definitive list of Italian fighters. You see these lists, but it's usually Italian American. And I wanted to include Italians from all over the world. That includes Hispanic Italians, Australian Italians, UK Italians, whatever. And so um, it, it's up this uh, this month's issue. So, so the print magazine of Ring Magazine is, is no longer in print, right? Um, there might be a couple of special editions uh, every year, maybe, you know, they might, might do one or two print issues a year, but for the most part, it's posted on the website. So there's a digital magazine now that you can get on the website and, and, and all that, uh, you get it online. So I won't reveal the entire article here because you have to be a subscriber. You got to pay guys, you got to pay for it, but uh, I'll just scroll down a little bit here. Um, Quanti Pugili. So this is just, uh, I got my top 15 right here of the all-time great Italian fighters, in my opinion. And then we get into what I call uh, honorable mentions. And I've got a bunch of names here under honorable mentions. And then I've got other notables. So even more. So there are dozens of fighters, literally dozens of fighters uh, that I share on this article. And I think a lot of you guys out there, um, will be surprised at some of the the names some of these guys i guarantee i got at least a couple of fighters on there that you didn't know about or maybe you didn't know they were italian maybe you thought whatever um it, there'll be some surprises on there for you and maybe some controversy because anytime you post a list or people out there who don't agree you know with the ranking and things like that that's all good bring the debate i want to hear about it so far the article has been very well received I want to give a shout out to my friend, Rolando Vitale, who wrote The Real Rockies. And I reference his book in my article. Um, he did extensive research, extensive research on this subject, but specific to Italian-American fighters. and wrote a comprehensive book on it called The Real Rockies, um, which you can still get on Amazon. I highly recommend it if you love boxing history. Uh, I love that stuff. So, so uh, books about different fighters from different backgrounds and in um, just how different groups of people made their mark in the sport. Like, I love that stuff. And um, so I, I gave Rolando a shout out in my article and he actually uh, contacted me this weekend and he mentioned that I forgot a few names. <laughs> uh, I figured Rolando would have a few few names out there. So um, I might have to make an update or, or post an update or something later on with a few more names um, of some Italians from different parts of the world, including Australia. So um, we'll see what happens with that. But just wanted to give my man Orlando a shout out. All right, guys, um, let's talk about this upcoming schedule. Uh, I, I wanted to 
talk about this because it's it's good. It's really good. In fact, it's it, it's a word that I don't like to use a lot. It's great. This upcoming schedule. So, so and I'm going to talk about all these fights here. But, you know, the first quarter, let's be honest, the first quarter of this year has been kind of dull. It's been kind of flat. I don't know about you guys, but I haven't been very interested in most of what's gone on. Uh, there's been a couple of interesting fights here or there, but nothing that I was like really, really looking forward to. Um, Parker Zhang may have been my favorite fight so far of the first quarter. And um, it, it's hard not to root for Parker um, in the run that he's been on. It's been great. By the way, I did an interview with a um, New Zealand uh, sports radio show. And I posted it here on my channel. If you haven't had a chance to check that out yet, check it out. We talk a lot about Joseph Parker and just a whole heavyweight division. Anyway, first quarter, um, kind of dull, right? Not a lot going on. L last year kind of ended kind of flat. So there hasn't been a whole lot of really, really big, interesting stuff to talk about lately. A lot of it's been about business stuff, you know, um, certain promotions leaving this network and go into that network, stuff like that. It hasn't been as much about the fights in the ring, right? So, but th that's going to change in the second quarter. It's going to change a lot. Let me um, let me share my screen one more time. Here. Hold this up because I want for, for the, and I'll, don't worry, I'll read it for you guys on the audio, but I just want to share uh, for you guys watching on the YouTubes. Okay, so this is the schedule that um, I don't really read ESPN, their uh, their boxing coverage. I really don't read it, but I do like the way they have their schedule laid out. And so I wanted to share this. Um, let's start at April 20, okay? April 20 of Brooklyn, Devin Haney versus Ryan Garcia. Um, I like this fight. I like it because it's two of the young guns going up against each other. I also like it because Ryan Garcia is going to be fully healthy. He won't be drained and, and the Haney's are not dictating, um, you know, everything he could do, you know, what time he can pee and what time he can poo. And <laughs> like, it's like, like Javante Davis and his team went a little too far with some of the demands, in my opinion, none of that's happening here. So it's a 100% version of Ryan Garcia. So, if his loss to Davis was a fluke and it was because of an injury, it was because he was weight drained and he couldn't eat this and couldn't drink that. Okay, here's your chance to prove us all wrong about you. Come out and have a good showing against Devin Haney, win, lose, or draw, and you'll prove yourself as one of the true young guns in the sport. For Devin Haney, this is your chance to have a little feather in your cap over uh Javante Davis, if you're able to defeat this fully healthy, full 140-pound version of Ryan Garcia, well, Tank Davis didn't do that. So you get to kind of hold that over his head. And that that's like the, the, the thing for Devin Haney here. So I like the matchup. Uh, originally, when I talked about it on the channel, at that time, it was being reported as a pay-per-view. Uh, or I'm sorry, I, I, I'm regular, um, I think the zone, I think it was regular to zone. Now it's being talked about as a pay-per-view as it stands right now. I really don't know. I honestly don't know if it's pay-per-view or not, but I believe it is, but I've heard conflicting reports. So if any of you guys out there could tell me, um, cause even here on ESPN on their schedule, they don't list it. They don't say if it's pay-per-view or not, they don't have any platform. Um, so I don't know. But, okay, let's continue. Um, starting May 4th, okay, May 4th and the the whole month after that, all the way to June 1st, okay, it's four weeks, five weekends, but four weeks, okay, five Saturdays, but four weeks. That's one month. And, guys, I'm struggling to think of a one-month schedule, a one-month run of fights featuring names and events that rivals this in my entire lifetime. I'm dead serious. I'm having a hard time. I'm not saying these are the greatest fights ever, not saying that, but I'm saying collectively, all the fights, all the talent, a lot of these guys are pound for pound. There's some undisputed in there. All of this within like five straight Saturdays, man. 
over one month. I could not think of a better schedule. This is by far the greatest month of boxing in the 2000s, this century, literally this century. And it may be of my entire lifetime. Okay. So May 4th, Canelo Alvarez versus Jaime Munguia in Las Vegas. This will be on Amazon Prime pay-per-view and DAZN pay-per-view. So it's one of these cross-promotion kind of things on multiple platforms. So look, first of, first of all, this fight's going to be a lot more competitive than a lot of you think. Now, a lot of you out there think that Canelo is just going to mop the floor with Munguia. You're wrong. Canelo's lost half a step, in my opinion. Munguia has improved. He's learned how to use his physicality. Um, he punches in volume. He's not a, he's not an elite level guy. I wouldn't put him you know on a pound for pound list or anything, but given his age, his size, his aggression, his style, and where Canelo is at hit this point in his career, all things considered, this will be a competitive fight. A lot more competitive than some of you are saying. I still think Canelo wins, particularly if it goes the distance, which I think it will. Uh, it's hard to beat Canelo on the cards in Las Vegas, right? So I expect Canelo to win this fight by decision, but I expect it to be entertaining. The atmosphere is going to be great. It's Mexican versus Mexican. So you're going to have all the Mexican-American fans and all the Mexican fans flying up to Vegas. Um, it's going to be just a great atmosphere there in town that weekend. And it's right around Cinco de Mayo, right? So that's going to be fun, man. But also, you know, a lot has been said about, you know, and, and, and including with me uh, on my channel, Canelo Alvarez and, and all the drama in the back and the forth and the soap opera, right? Because he had this three fight deal with PBC and that blew up because he didn't like the terms that they were giving him and stuff. So then he goes over to Matchroom and negotiates with them and he doesn't like their proposal comes back to PBC, and ultimately, we end up with this fight. I find it very, very interesting that the PBC, who, generally speaking, they do not work across the aisle. They're willing to do this kind of cross-promotion thing here. Uh, it's interesting. By the way, that three-fight deal is ripped up. That's shredded, right? That's that's no longer going. This is like a, a one-off, as I understand it. Anyway, here's the... The silver lining in all this and the, the positive part of it, um, when I look at this, we have multiple promotional, managerial, advisory, and sanctioning entities working together here. I mentioned it's on Amazon Prime pay-per-view, which is PBC's platform, obviously, and then the Zone pay-per-view, which is Golden Boy promotion or yeah, Golden Boy Promotions um, platform. And a few different uh, uh, promoters have their their fights on the zone. But anyway, so it's it's on two pl uh, broadcast platforms, and then of course all the sanctioning organizations are involved because it's for the undisputed super middleweight championship. You have uh, TGB Promotions working with Canelo Promotions, and then working with um, I, I think Mungi is represented by Golden Boy. I'm pretty sure, right? Golden Boy, and then also maybe Zanfer. So there's just multiple parties working together here in getting this done. I love that. And I sure wish we got more of that in boxing. So hats off to everybody involved that got this done, including the folks at PBC and Amazon Prime for getting this thing done. And I think it's going to be a fun event and a better fight than a lot of you expect. Two days later, <clears throat> Two days later, in Tokyo, Naoya Inoue versus Luis Neri. And this will be on ESPN Plus. And it kicks off uh, about four fights in a row from ESPN that are just outstanding. <laughs> outstanding. ESPN Plus, top rank right now, is the best value. I've been saying it for a while now. It's currently the best value in the entire sport. For, for in America, at least for an American fan, it is the best value. I think for a lot of you guys in different parts of the world, the zone is the best value for you uh, here in America. The price point is just too crazy. Anyway, Luis Neri has history over in Japan, right? There's some bad blood there. Neri in a way wants revenge. So you got the revenge factor here. You got Japan versus Mexico, which is, I, I think, probably become the most lively rivalry in boxing in these last few years you know 
Um, and and they, in a way, a lot of people have him pound for pound number one. Luis Neri, he is a good fighter. He can crack. He's got some solid wins. This will be a fun fight, man. And I love that they're going to show this live from Tokyo. I've talked about this before. This is one of the, the pluses, one of the really cool parts of boxing in 2024 with all these apps. There are downsides, plenty of them, but there are good sides. And like, I'm going to be able to get up on, I think this is a Tuesday morning or maybe a Monday morning. I'm going to get up and have, you know, be having my coffee, waking up my toddler and my baby and getting them settled and, you know, all that watching the Yoya Inouye versus Luis Neri. That's just too cool, man. So I, I can't wait for that one. The following Saturday, May 11th, from Perth, Australia, Vasily Lomachenko versus George Cambosos Jr. for the vacant IBF lightweight title. This is the title, one of the titles that Devin Haney vacated when he moved up to 140. He was the undisputed champion. A lot of people out there feel that Lomachenko should be the undisputed champion and he should already have all the belts and not be fighting for a vacant belt. But that's not the way it went down in the books, right? Devin Haney got the decision, undisputed lightweight champion, moves up and wait. All the belts are vacant now. And so you get uh, Loma versus Cambosos for one of the vacant belts. Now, I think this fight will be more competitive than people think. I think a lot of people are like, oh, Cambosos is not an elite guy. Lomachenko is. Yeah, that's that's true. But Lomachenko has also clearly lost half a step, and he's still a blown-up featherweight. So, look, I favor Lomachenko. I think he'll win this fight by decision. But uh, this is going to be competitive. Being in Australia, having the crowd behind him and all that, I think it's going to be a really fun atmosphere for Cambosos. Um, it's going to be fun to watch this, man. And this is another one that's going to be – uh, airing live. I don't know what time yet this will be on in the States, but it will definitely be at some point during the day, maybe the afternoon or something like that. That's a lot of fun, man. The following week, May 18th, the following Saturday, I should say, Alexander Usyk versus Tyson Fury from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, this will be on pay-per-view as well. Uh, I'm not sure where, but this, I, this is a top-ranked promotion, at least here in the States. So I guess it'll be an ESPN pay-per-view. I don't know. They don't list it here on ESPN site. So I, maybe they're still working all that out. Uh, now they have it on mul- a lot of these pay-per-views are on multiple platforms. Like you can go to pay-per-view.com and, you know, all these different places. Sometimes the zone will pick up ESPN plus pay-per-views and, and distribute them on their app. So it's probably going to be in multiple places. That's my hunch. But anyway, undisputed heavyweight championship. And of course, this fight was supposed to happen in the first quarter. It got bumped back because Fury cut his eye. Is it too soon? I don't know. Has, uh, you know, breaking camp and restarting camp, is that bad for Fury? Good for Fury? Bad for Usyk? Good for Usyk? I don't know. We'll find out. But that fight, look, if Fury wins, it's he's, he's the undisputed champion. And the only fight for him left at that point would be a fight between him and Anthony Joshua, which would set records. It would set it would just smash all kinds of records commercially. That'd be such a huge fight. It might be the biggest sporting event in UK history. Seriously. I know it sounds crazy. I'm talking commercially, the numbers, the revenue, um, the ratings, all of that, the attendance. I really think it could smash records. So if Fury wins, this is a, a – a stamp on his legacy, and he could say, hey, I was undisputed champion. And then he could either have the big money fight against Anthony Joshua, or he can walk away. If Usyk wins, well, he proves, in my opinion, that he's an all-time great. I mean, a lot of people already view him as an all-time great. He's absolutely an all-time great cruiserweight. But if he's able to beat Tyson Fury, the size difference between these two is massive. If he's able to do that, um, keep in mind, Fury is undefeated. You know, a lot of people thought he lost to Francis Ngannou. Um, I personally believe, and I'm not alone in this, that he ducked the Vladimir Klitschko rematch when Vada testing was forced. I mean, there are some holes in this guy's resume, right? He's been dropped by five or six different fighters, uh, some of them journeymen. All that being said, he's undefeated. He's never lost, technically as a professional prize fighter. So if Usyk, by the way, neither of these guys have, but if Usyk can beat Fury, 
uh, and be the first to officially do that. And with the size difference and everything else, um, and then undisputed at cruiser and heavyweight, no one's done that in this era. It's been done before, but not in the quote unquote four belt era. Uh, we're talking, we're having a different conversation about Alexander Usyk if that takes place, if that happens. The following Saturday, um, Taylor versus Catterall 2. Now, this fight was supposed to happen. I should mention it's in Leeds, England, ESPN Plus here in the States. Uh, Josh Taylor was, of course, the former undisputed 140-pound champion. He had uh, several belts stripped and then ended up losing to Tiafima Lopez. But before that, he fought Catterall. I don't know if it was last year or the year before. It's all blurred to me. But a lot of people thought Jack Catterall won that fight. A lot of people. I thought Taylor edged it. I was fine with the decision. I think maybe the scorecards might have been too wide, but I, I was cool with Taylor getting it because I thought Catterall just kind of let it slip from his fingers. But so let's give Taylor credit. Um, he He's taken this rematch, and he's wanted it for a while. It, it's been pushed back for multiple reasons. People now will say, well, he's lost to Teofimo Lopez, so he needs the Jack Catterall fight. Does he? I don't think he needs this fight. Is it, this isn't like he, Jake Catterall or Jack, sorry, Jack Catterall is some huge brand. He wants this fight and he wants to show that he's the, the better man and, um, and improve it definitively. So props to him and props to Catterall for stepping up and doing this again. Uh, that should be a fun fight to watch. Uh, once again, ESPN plus live here in the States um, from over, over in England. So it should be on earlier in the evening here. And it will be a fun atmosphere. Those shows over in England are always a lot of fun. And then uh, last but not least on this list, June 1st, it's a week after May 25th, um, uh, Saturday, June 1st, Dmitry Bivol versus Artur Biderbiev for the Undisputed Light Heavyweight Championship of the World. For my money, this is the best fight that could be made in boxing right now. These are two pound-for-pound -pound guys, definitely pound-for-pound -pound top 10 fighters. Um, and I just think that completely unifying the light heavyweight division, that's special, but also these two guys are so clearly the best two fighters in that division, right? They're so far above number three and number four, and number five, who, wh however you rank them, whoever you rate in those positions, these two guys are definitively undisputed, undeniably the top two guys. So you're getting a true number one versus number two, right? There, there's no speculation with that. And I love when you get that. Both of these guys are still uh, close to their prime. Um, maybe there's they might be slightly over the hill, you know, coming down the tail end of their prime or something. But they're still both prime fighters, I think, right in the, the thick of their careers. It should be great, man. And then what they're saying is uh, Deontay Wilder will be on this card fighting Zeli Zhang. Jalei Zhang, uh, who just lost to Joseph Parker, but that was pretty recently. He was fat and out of shape for that fight, and he could have gone for a rematch against Parker because there was a rematch clause. But um, Turkey al Sheikh, His Excellency, put up some cash, and Zhang went for the cash. And Wilder came off a loss to Joseph Parker recently as well too, right? So both of these guys have recently lost to Joseph Parker. They're going to fight each other. In terms of styles, and size and all that that's gonna be a fun fight dude i i would that alone would would be you know of high interest to me and i'd be watching it but the fact that it's going to be on this card as like a co-feature that's crazy and philip hergovich is fighting daniel dubois that's what they're saying too so you're gonna get all three of those fights guys that's the best card I can think of just the top, those three fights together. That's the best card I can think of in a long time, a really long time. And uh, the last I heard, this card was just going to be on regular ESPN. Now, I'm looking at ESPN site here. They don't list it as being on ESPN, so they might still be negotiating. It might end up going to pay-per-view, especially if you get those two heavyweight fights added to it. They're probably going to have to go pay-per-view. But they're going to get my money. <laughs> they're, they're going to get my money because of the main event and the two heavyweight fights, man. Uh, so if all that could come off and happen, 
props to everybody involved. And I can't wait to watch that one. Uh, they'll, my birthday's in June, so that'll be an early birthday present for me. I should also mention uh, June 29th, Juan Francisco Estrada is fighting Bam Rodriguez in Phoenix. Stephen Breadman Edwards, in my opinion, one of the smartest men in boxing. Uh, just a really smart guy with really, really great takes. Um, he posted a tweet, I'm going to paraphrase, but he basically said, I like Bam Rodriguez in this fight and I like him big. And he stated his reasons why, but I agree with Redman. I think this will be fun, competitive. It will be an awesome atmosphere there in Phoenix. I can't wait to watch that one. That's going to be a lot of fun. But Bam Rodriguez, his career trajectory is, is climbing. He's going up, right? He's entering his prime. I don't even know if he's in his prime yet, but he's, he's on his way. Juan Francisco Estrada has been one of my favorite little fighters of this last generation. I've had him on my pound for pound list for years before – a lot of these other publications finally caught on, right? Um, you know, I was a hipster fan of his, if you will, right? He was one of those kind of guys for me, along with Chocolatito and all these other guys. But he's only had four fights since 2019. He had no fights last year. So I think inactivity and his age is going to catch up with him here. And I like Bam Rodriguez, but that's still a fantastic fight. Okay. Wow, what a freaking schedule. What a freaking schedule, man. And again, I'm going to ask you guys, can you think of a better month in boxing, a month run of fights? I'm just looking top to bottom here. I can't think of a better from, – from May 4th through June 1st. Again, that's five Saturdays, but collectively it's four weeks. It's one month. I can't think of a month that had more – think of the names here, guys. Canelo. Inouye, Lomachenko, Usyk, Fury, Bivol, Peter Biev. Those are all like pound for pound level guys, right? Uh, Josh Taylor, former undisputed champion. Deontay Wilder, former heavyweight title holder. Um, I just Jaime Munguia, he's he's been a title holder. Uh, Luis Neri, I think, has had a title holder. George Cambosos was what uh, was he undisputed lightweight champion or I think unified lightweight champion. Uh, so, so just all the names and the talent in that month, it's awesome. <laughs> I'm so excited about it. And I haven't been excited about boxing a whole lot lately because we just haven't been getting the fights, man. But this run, and again, I'm not saying like these are the greatest fights you can make, although two of them are. I mean, Usyk Fury, come on. And uh, Bivol Beater BF, come on. Those are seriously the two best fights you can make in the sport right now. And they're happening. So that's great. But here's another thing I'm noticing about this, and it's indicative of what I talk about on the show a lot, of uh, boxing, the culture of it changing and it becoming more global, and this sport being more globalized than it's ever been at any point in its history. I'm looking at these names, guys. And I'm looking, first of all, the locations of the fights. We have, the first one's in Vegas, Canelo Munguia. Of course, you got to go to Vegas, but then we have Tokyo. We have Australia. We have Saudi Arabia. We have England. Uh, Zang or B Bivol versus Bitter Biev. Where is that taking place? I can't remember. Where is that one taking place? That's not in America, is it? No, that's that's in Saudi Arabia too. So another Saudi Arabia fight. Okay, so, so like of all the fights during that month, there's only one fight in America. The rest are in other parts of the world. Yeah, we're going to be able to watch live because of the streaming apps, the technology that we have now. I'm also looking at the names. How many American fighters are on this list? Canelo Mugia are Mexican. Inouye Neri, Japanese Mexican. Lomachenko Cambosos, you have Ukrainian Australian. Usyk Fury, you have Ukrainian English. Taylor Catterall, English. Bivol Beter Biev, Russian. No Americans, dude. Wow. Now, I mentioned April 20, Devin Haney, Ryan Garcia, that's two Americans. Uh, June 29th, I mentioned Bam Rodriguez, he's American, right? So, so, okay. But during that one month run, no Americans, only one fight taking place in America. I think that's just very symbolic of where we are at in this sport right now. It is truly a global sport. And I think that's awesome. <clears throat> Oh, man, my cousin's on the chat here. My cousin Ricky's on the chat. What's up, Ricky? How you doing, man? 
<laughs> oh, shit. Good to see you, man. <clears throat> All right, guys. Uh, I got to, uh, my man John saying nice shirt. I appreciate it, brother. Yeah, this shirt, pretty awesome. There's a couple names missing. You know, you could, I mean, if you list all the Italian greats, then have to like have a moo moo on or something like that. But yeah, this shirt's pretty great. Um, okay. <clears throat> Andrew says, uh, Michael, you need to come out of retirement, get the Saudi bag, my friend. It's funny you say that, man. Um, I've thought about getting back in there and uh, doing another fight. I actually, I got back into the boxing gym a couple weeks ago and I've just gone a couple times. And it, the, the timing isn't sharp, you know, and I, I'm out of shape, but the skills are still there. I can still do all the combos and do all the movements and it's all still there. So, you know, my coach is, is telling me, it's like, dude, we can go for another one if you want to. And we're, we're talking about it. Um, I'm, I'm 50, 50 on it because right now it's just really hard with the two kids, but I'd love to, because here's the thing. The fight that I did last September, I think I, I may have mentioned this on my show. I may have not, but there was a guy I was supposed to fight. And, you know, the matchmakers had looked at him and be like, okay, you two guys work really well together. He was close to my height. He was, you know, tall. So it, it, it just, it would have been a good match. Um, but he fell out because he went to jail for armed robbery, <laughs> like a week before the fight. And you guys already know that I had had several fights already canceled on me over the summer because I wanted to do like three or four of them. And these events kept getting canceled. People kept pulling out, whatever. So I was like, oh, man, not again. Not again, right? The promotion, to their credit, they found a replacement, last second replacement. This guy was 5'10", 5'11", bent over at the waist. So I was having to punch down. It was extremely awkward. He couldn't really challenge me. No disrespect. I'm just saying for a last second replacement, he was awkward as hell. It was a 90 second fight. It was a 90 second fight. And I didn't really get to, to showcase anything. You know, I got to do a lot more of my amateur fights. So um, I'd love to get in there again with, with a, an opponent that's, you know, a little higher level that can push me a little bit and um, force me to show some of the things I could do. That's, you know, so that's what I think about. And I talk about that with my wife and she goes, I get it. And my coach. And he's like, I get it. But both of them also say, Mike, you got a first round knockout in a pro fight. Most people can't say that. So, you know, don't, don't be upset that you didn't get a four round war because yeah, that'd be great. You get to showcase some of your skills, but also it'd be a four round war. You got this dude out in 90 seconds. Hey, that's a good thing. So, um, you know, it's that back and forth. It's those two little voices on my shoulders that keep going back and forth. Uh, let's see. Timmy Turner says, uh, Carmen Basilio, the best Italian boxer ever. No, but he is in my all time greats list. I'm not going to give you the number, but he's definitely up there. Um, definitely one of the greats for sure. But I don't say um, the best. No. You know, there's a name that a lot of you guys out there don't know. And I'm, I'm surprised that it just this guy just doesn't get enough shine. Tony Canzaneri. A lot of you guys out there need to look him up. Tony Canzaneri, one of the most underrated fighters of all time. This guy was, in my opinion, I don't know if I call him top 10 pound for pound, all time great, but close. He's on that level. Okay. <clears throat> there have been so many great fighters. So, so it's but definitely top 20, top 20 pound for pound all time. Guy had one of the best careers ever, but he was fighting out of New Orleans. So it's like a small market. If he had fought out in New York, maybe more people would have heard of him. Um, but Google that name. Anyway, Timmy, um, I, I mentioned Canzanari because I, I rate him above Bas uh, Basilio. <clears throat> Alexander says Montero versus Biden would be fight of the year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not, I'm not touch of that one. The press conference would be great. Wouldn't it? <clears throat> the press conference would be awesome. Um, BB mute man says, Mike, who do you want to see in the Queensberry and Matchroom five versus five? Yeah. I heard about that. I don't know all the details about it yet. So I, I don't want to comment quite yet. Is it literally five versus five at one time? 
Like five dudes, like they're going to have 10 guys in the ring or is it five versus five, like five fights on the car? I don't know. You guys are going to have to give me the details on that, but I saw that that deal had been struck and I saw the press release and all that. I just haven't really looked into it. Um, but you know, if they're going to do five versus five, like do all heavyweights, bro. Throw a bunch of big ass heavyweights in there and uh, let them all fight it out. That'd be hilarious. It'd be hilarious. It, it, well, hilarious depending on who they put in there. It could also be really entertaining and fun depending on who they put in there. Okay, real quick. Um, let's preview what's coming up this weekend. I'll jump to some phone calls. All right, guys. Uh, let's see. Oh, a BB mute man says uh, five fights on the card: featherweight, two heavies, lightweight. Okay. Yeah, I got to think about it. I got to think about it. And middleweight. So they're all over the board. So they've got middleweight, heavyweights, lightweights, featherweights. I like that. I like that. It should be a lot of fun, man. That would be a lot of fun for sure. It's it's like something like that could really, really work over in the UK. The fans over there are great and they support, you know, quote unquote, domestic level boxers. You could throw a bunch of domestic level fighters. I don't use that disrespectfully. I just mean guys who maybe aren't at the elite world level but domestically are very, very competitive and um, fan friendly, right? And they bring a, fa a fan base from their hometown or home region, whatever. Uh, you could put an event like that on in England, in the UK, and it will sell. It'll work. Here in America, I don't know. I don't know. Like it, you'd have to make it kind of a circus freak show. You'd have to have Jake Paul on there and uh, Mike Tyson. Funny enough, those two are actually fighting in July, right? But it'd have to be like those types of names to get the casual interest over here, you know? Anyway, um, this Friday, March 29th in Glendale, Arizona on ESPN Plus, Oscar Valdez versus Liam Wilson, 12 rounds, 130 pounds. And then Sinise Estrada, super bad, going up against Yocasta Valle, a Nicaragua native for the undisputed minimum weight title. These are really tiny little ladies, 105 pounds. Really, really tiny, but attractive young ladies. And I've known Sinicia for years. Um, I mean, Tiffany, my, my wife and I met her when she was just a, a prospect. They've only had two or three fights, I think, as a pro at that point. And um, worked out at their gym down there in South LA. At, at least that's where she was then. And um, couldn't have been nicer. And her family was awesome. And so we've kept in touch since and uh, follow each other on social and all that good stuff. And I think she's one of the top five pound for pound female fighters in the world. I've been saying that for years. Um, she's the real deal. She's a real fighter, a real fighter. And I enjoy watching her fight. This Saturday, March 30th, we got to talk about the Big pay-per-view show. But before I get to that, uh, in Inglewood, California, on DAZN, Arsene Gol Golamirian. I'm probably butchering that. An Armenian French fighter who now fights and trains out of California. Going up against Gilberto Ramirez for Golamirian's WBA Super Cruiserweight title. This will be his fifth defense. He won the belt in 2018. Uh I mentioned this fight because it's 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 crazy how far the cruiserweight division has fallen. Um, no disrespect to these two guys. Keep in mind, Gilberto Ramirez was a super middleweight, then a light heavyweight. Now he's fighting for um, for a cruiserweight belt. But the World Boxing Super Series, they had the cruiserweight tournaments, and that division was red hot at that time. And you had some real talent. Um, Dortikos, Bredis, Gassiev, of course, Usyk, right? You had you had some big names. Um, Marco Huck was still around, I think. Lebedev, the Russian. You had some, some names in that division and, and a lot of talent. And it is just, pew, it's like the dollar since Joe Biden came in office. Pew, pew, it's just bombed. It's just nowhere. Uh, so, I just, I, I saw this fight on the schedule and I'm like, man, cruiserweights. Oh yeah. I remember them. <laughs> you know, cruiserweight is just dead. Um, there's, there's a fighter there now that I really, really, really like a kid from, uh, from what Australia. Um, but there's just, just no definitive. There, there's no top dog that has all the belts and stuff. There's just no star in the division. I don't know. It's a disaster. 
It's not as bad as middleweight, though. Middleweight is an absolutely dead division. Dead. So uh, that's kind of sad because of you know, middleweight's a historic division. Anyway, also Saturday, March 30th in Las Vegas, it's the launch of Premier Boxing Champions PBC on Amazon Prime pay-per-view. Tim Zhu in the main event, Australia's Tim Zhu, flying all the way over to Las Vegas to fight Sebastian Fondora for Zhu's WBO and the vacant WBC junior middleweight title. Now, I'm still pissed because I wrote a preview of this whole card for Ring Magazine that was going to be in the this month's issue as well. I was going to have two pieces in there. Worked hard on it, all right? And um, it, that at that time, it was Tim Zhu versus Keith Thurman. When that blew up, my article got scrapped. So damn you, Keith Thurman. By the way, Keith Thurman cited a, uh, I think, a bicep injury. Did he ever show any medical evidence of that injury? If he has, guys, let me know, because I probably just missed it. Um, I'm definitely half in, half out of the loop here, um, you know, with everything I got going on. But I haven't seen any proof, any doctor's note, any x-rays or whatever, MRI imaging, uh, to show that that was a real injury. Looks kind of, I don't know, it's kind of shady to me. Anyway, yeah, I'm just a little bitter. Yeah, I'm just bitter because my piece got scrapped. <laughs> but um, Sebastian Fondora, who was going to fight Sergei Bohachuk on the card, which was actually my favorite fight on this card. I thought, okay, this this is the one fight that like I'm really interested in. I want to check this out. Um, he gets bumped up. Fondora gets bumped up to this uh, unified title fight. It's going to be for two belts now. OK, because the WBC recently had stripped um, Charlo, undisputed champion, and um, Zoo had won the WBO and I think in his last fight. And now they're putting up the vacant WBC. Sebastian Fundora, for those of you who don't remember, is coming off a really bad knockout loss last, I think last June. I can't remember what month it was off the top of last April. Um it just it was a devastating loss, knockout loss. It was bad. He hasn't fought since. He's walking straight from that into not just a pay per view headliner, but a two belt championship fight. It's it's hard to justify all that, but it is a last minute replacement. There are a lot of people out there that thought Sergei Bohachuk should have been bumped up and given the opportunity, but demographics. And marketing play a role in this, right? It's a business. And I think the brass there at uh, PBC feels they're going to get more uh, potential revenue, more fans, sell more tickets, more pay-per-views, et cetera, with Fondora fighting Zoo rather than Bohachuk. And uh, the WBC, of course, they want to get in on that and get some sanctioning fees, get that shut up. So, um, so, you know, they're going to jump in and do their thing. This fight... I think it'll be competitive just because Fundora, look, Zoo is preparing for Keith Thurman. I just talked about it a bit of my own experience facing a last minute opponent. It's awkward because you're you're preparing for a certain thing. I was sparring against tall, skinny guys, right? And then I get in there with a short, fat guy. And it, it, it changes everything up that you've been working on. So Zoo's been preparing for a 9,000-year-old Keith Thurman who does certain things well, even at his age. And now he's in there with Fundora, who's a completely different guy, completely different animal, right? You're punching up at this dude. He's long as hell, right? He's kind of awkward. So um, that's a tough assignment for Zoo. Like on paper, I think a lot of people are like, oh, this he's Fundora is coming off a knockout loss. He hasn't fought in almost a year. I think it'll be pretty much a year when this fight happens this Saturday for, for uh, Fundora being out of the ring. Zoo's been active, blah, 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 blah. I get it. On the surface, yes. Zoo wins this fight and wins it big. He wins it by stoppage in the late rounds. That's my prediction. But you're at least going to see some scary moments from Fundora um, early on just because last-minute replacements do that. They, they – it's one thing if you replace your opponent with a guy who's kind of similar, but when this dude's like literally like a foot taller, <laughs> literally like a foot taller than the guy you were about to face and you were sparring to prepare for that, 
And now you're like, what the hell? We got to get Shaq in here to spar to prepare for this dude. Like it's, it changes everything up. So there is a chance for an upset special here. Uh, but I, I like zoo in this. Obviously I completely disagree with this fight being on pay-per-view. I'm not going to sit here and beat up on PBC, but look, this is just what PBC does. This is their business model and how they do things. Fundora is not a star. Tim Zhu is a superstar in his homeland, but not here. This has no business being on pay-per-view. And even with Keith Thurman, if it was still Zhu versus Thurman, no business being on pay-per-view. Um, they really should launch this on just regular Amazon Prime. Anyway. I've said my piece on that. Also on this card, Rolando Romero versus Isaac Cruz for Romero's WBA 140-pound title. That title is worthless. It's worth the uh, paper that I'm crumbling up right now. That's basically, I think, the WBA is what, regular belt, I think it is. And then Irizlandi Lara versus Michael Zarafa for Lara's WBA middleweight title. I mentioned before that the middleweight division's dead. This is a prime example of it. A nine billion year old Irislandi Lara is fighting Michael Zarafa for one of the legitimate titles because I think this is the WBA like real title, not the regular or whatever. So, um, and then look, Zarafa, I guess they threw him on here because like, oh, another Australian that'll get more Australian people to watch. I don't know what the the line of thinking there was, but anyway. This Sunday, March 31st in Japan, there are two minimum weight title fights and then Fabio Wardley heavyweight fights in London. So, okay. Preview's done. <clears throat> let's jump to the phone. Uh, let's get our first call. Looks like we got Nacho on the line. Nacho, what's up, brother? How you doing? Hey, Mike. Uh, long time no hear from you. Uh, pretty sure that... Uh, them two kids are keeping you up all night. Uh, oh. That's why you haven't been able to do this. So, Dude, really. <laughs> my youngest is teething right now. Yeah. She's teething, and it's just, ugh, it's crazy. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I kind of figured that's what it was. But, hey, at least I caught you uh, when you do have a show on right now. Um, just real quick, Mike, you were talking about it. Um, uh, the reason Zarafa was on the card, because he did an interview a while back, he basically was the number one contender for that title, for the BA title at middleweight. Okay. Um, but he's been sitting on his butt for almost a whole year, if not a little more than a year now, because he won the fight to become the contender. I want to say it was either the end of 22 or the beginning of last year. So he is sitting there waiting for these guys to give him a shot at Lara because he said the PBC approached him and said, they would give him a two fight deal where he would fight a stay busy fight um, while Lara and Danny Garcia were supposed to fight. Mm. And because that fight never happened, he never got the stay busy fight. Mm. So he's literally been sitting on the sidelines waiting for this title shot. So it's going to be interesting to see both these guys who have not fought recently yeah. fight each other on Saturday. So, um, it's going to be like two rust buckets going at it. So, yeah. it's, I mean, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, on the, uh, as far as the main event, Mike, I think you're right. Boachuk on paper would have deserved a better shot at Zoo. I just think the only reason that they're going with Fundora is because they have more of a stake in Fundora if he wins versus if Boachuk was to pull off the upset. Those two belts go to a promoter that they have no ties with in Tom Law. It's a great point. So great I think point. that's why they did it too, Mike. Yeah. I think that's why they did it too. They didn't want to run the risk that if Boachuk wins that fight, they don't get a shot at those two belts. Mm. So, you know, I, I think it that played a big factor in it too. But at least Boachuk's getting a fight against Brian Mendoza. That should be an yeah. entertaining fight. And Mendoza's so, the guy who knocked know, out Fundora, so it's kind of interesting the you know the way it's all working out. And is that fight still going to yeah. be like for an interim belt? No, apparently it's just off. a regular fight because okay. the interim the interim is uh, the belt they're putting up for Fundora to face Zoo. That was the belt uh, Bochuk was supposed to get the shot at. Okay, yeah, I feel bad for oh, wait, Bochuk, no, no. man. You know what, I feel Mike, bad. I'm sorry. Mike, I apologize. No, I'm sorry. You're right. 
I saw something the other day where someone stated that they talked to Suleiman, and Suleiman said they're putting up an interim bill for this fight between Mendoza and Boa. Okay. And the winner gets the shot at the winner of Zoo Fundora. There you go. Okay, That's I like was. that. I like oh, that. Oh, you were right, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so at least he doesn't get screwed out of a uh, of a fight and he gets a shot at either Fundora or Zoo, whoever happens to win. But I think you're right, Mike. I think Zoo should win the fight. Is this going to be interesting to see if Fundora's made any changes? I don't think he has. I think he's still going to see the same guy, the tall guy who likes to go on the inside, throws a lot of wide looping shots, uh, is a volume guy, but leaves his chin exposed, doesn't uh, use his jab all the time. So I think he'll be in there for a minute, but I think eventually Zoo will break him down and stop him in the late rounds, like you said, Mike. Um, the fight of the weekend that I'm looking forward to is the one you just kind of briefly went over, Mike. I think that's kind of going to be kind of an interesting fight between Wardley and Clark. Uh -huh. I think those two guys are kind of like, you know, on the precipice of being part of that next group coming out of England that are heavyweights. So it'll be interesting to see which guy, like the winner, where he goes, does he become a contender after that fight? And then the loser is going to have to go to the back of the line and kind of start, you know, from scratch all over. So it's kind of like in the mold of those uh, James DeGale, George Groves type of fights, you know, where those guys kind of got it on when they were still prospects. Mm -hmm. So I I'm curious to see how that fight um, pans out. And then um, the uh, Friday night card, um, the top rank card, Mike, uh, Liam Wilson Valdez should be a war mm -hmm. for as long as it lasts. Um, I'm just wondering how much does Valdez really have left because he's been in so many wars over the years that I'm just kind of wondering eventually the, the tread is going to come off the tires when it comes to him. Like, how much is he going to have left to, to beat Wilson with? Because Wilson's the fresher, younger guy in there versus Valdez has just been in so many tough fights over the years that. I mean, I hope Valdez can get one more legit win, but if he can't beat Wilson, then I think he needs to start thinking about, like, walking away. I mean, he's had a lot of big paydays in his career, and he's won a, a belt, you know, a couple belts. Like, he doesn't really have a whole lot to prove at this point, you know? Uh, I'd, I'd hope he'd be smart enough to walk away, but uh, we'll see uh, what happens with that. And then... Uh, just a quick question for you, Mike. Shakur Stevenson keeps putting out there that he's got a fight date in July. Um, nobody has officially been announced. But if it were up to you, who would you prefer to see him in there with? Uh, William Zapata or Raymond Morataya? Hmm. I'm going to go with Zapata. But, I mean, I, I, you can't go wrong either way. Um but I, I just I want to see him in there with Zapata because Zapata has been on a pretty good run, and um, I think it'd be just fun just style wise. I think maybe he could give Shakur something to think about um, and make it. And Shakur Stevenson fights are just not entertaining, so maybe Zapata can make it entertaining. I think it'd be fun. You don't think Murataya could make it entertaining because oh, he, he, he fights? Yeah, he could. Someone similar. To, okay. Yeah, I was just kind of thinking, I don't think you can go wrong with yeah. either one of those guys. And now my other question is, do you think he takes on one of those two guys next? No, <laughs> I don't. Unless yeah. unless okay. they negotiate money or something, and that's what's going on right now, and they're going to have to up the money or something, but I don't think so. I don't think so. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah, I kind of figured. I figured you'd probably say, yeah, he's not going to fight either one of those guys, to be honest with you. I just don't think him and his team want to run the risk of him being in there with guys that are just tough and they're going to keep coming at him, you know, especially after his performance against De Los Santos. Yeah, I, I just don't see it. I think he's going to try to fight some guy who's a lot easier, a more of a of a easy pickings that he can look good against. And those guys have size, too, because, right, like, Stevenson's fought – guys that come to him, but not with that size. You know what I mean? So I agree with you, Nacho. Yeah. They're, they're either his size or they're bigger than him. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, yeah I think that would definitely trouble him. So, all right, Mike, I'm going to let you go. I'm sure you got other people waiting. All right. Thanks, Nacho. Have a good one. All right. Thanks.
You do. All right, we're going to keep it rolling here. Let's go to Sila901. What's up? How you doing, brother? Hey, Mike, how you doing? I was uh, calling in to throw in my favorite all-time, my all-time favorite Italian-American boxing star. Um, and I, I don't know if you got these guys on the list, but these guys, uh, you know, these these guys may be famous elsewhere, but they haven't been famous for boxing, and I think we should give them the recognition they deserved after all they earned it. They stepped into the ring, you know. They took the hits and they uh, they fought the fight. So first up, this guy. Uh, just, just just four of them, but uh, I know you left them off your list. Four of them from uh, 1929, 1930. This guy got 24 KOs in a row. That's unheard of today, unless you're Deontay Wilder and your first what 30 fights against tomato cans. Uh, well, in fact, this guy kind of was the Deontay Wilder of that era. It's Primo Carnera. Oh. 32 to 34, <laughs> 24 KOs in a row from in, in just two years. How uh, did I leave Primo Carnera off my list? How did you leave Primo Carnera? Yeah, plus he's the biggest Italian American all time great. Wow, I don't know. All right, and we all, yeah, and you know, he, he gets a lot of uh flack, Primo Carnera. You know, a lot of guys say that he was trash. I think he's actually underrated. I think he was a better fighter than people give him credit for. Um, obviously, he wasn't great, but he was definitely better than a lot of people give him credit for. I can't believe well, I forgot it's, about it's, Primo Carnera. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how yeah. could you forget about the ambling out? I don't know. I mean, I feel I feel so <laughs> stupid right now. Good job, c -Line. You just I made mean, me feel really dumb. <laughs> One thought about Primo Carnera takes up as much space as fifty, as, as much as the fifty hours of Paulie Malignaggi yapping. <laughs> yeah, and Paulie's on the list. <laughs> I got Paulie on there. Uh, Chad, Chad's well, Chad's you know, giving me a, a a a bailout here. He said Chad in the chat says it's called Dad Brain. He's absolutely right. I'm using that as an excuse. Well, that's okay. You got your priorities, but I got mine, and that's that's why I'm here calling you on the phone. All right, Another all right. one. I can be sure that you left off. This guy's nickname was the Chin, and uh, it uh, wasn't because he had one. Yeah. Uh, well, he had a big one. One and four. You got a big one. This guy had a big one, but he didn't have necessarily the strongest one. Twenty-one and four. Some of his wins were against opponents with a winning record. Not all. Not most. But some, uh, this this guy, uh, you know, he went on to bigger and better things. Uh, <laughs> yeah, same you can say guy. that. Vinny the, yeah, Vincent the Chin Gigante. Yeah. So uh, you know, that guy equally as famous, and of course we have my favorite. Uh, he was so he he's his uh, winning record is eight uh, wins, all eight by KO, and he hit. So hard that uh, he made it big on television. We got Tony Danza. I knew you were going with That's Tony right. Danza. Awesome. That's right. And of course, you know, we, we, I, maybe this guy just gets an honorable mention, but for an Italian, this is probably the whitest nickname you could have. And this is Tommy Cornflake Lamana. Ah, yeah. yeah. Not olive oil, not scongeli. Yeah, cornflake. <laughs> anyway. That's awesome. He may not. He may. <laughs> he may not have an Italian attitude like Roberto Duran, but he <laughs> certainly has an Italian heart, and he will take on anybody, even when he has no business doing it. My heart's still a little bit broken for them putting him in the ring against Eric Landy Lara, mm. but I like the guy, and I think he's and I, and I think he's cool, and he's got the balls and the heart that a lot of fighters don't have, even though he may not have the talent. I agree. Man, great call, dude. Oh. Uh, these four names, wow. Yeah, it, it, Tony Danza, I should, you know, you got to put him in the piece. Gigante, I mean, wow. Wow, good stuff, man. All right, buddy, you have a good one. You too, Ceylon. Thanks a lot, man. All right, my pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, good stuff, man. Yeah, because a lot of you guys probably don't know this, but Tony Danza, some of you younger guys are like, who the hell is Tony Danza? But if you're over 30, you know who Tony Danza is. And uh, he did fight. He was actually, you know, he was pretty good. He, he's a pretty good fighter. Uh, Vincent, Vincent the Chin Gigante was a pretty good fighter too. 
Uh, obviously, these guys weren't great, but they were pretty good. They had respectable records, and they were legit records. These guys, had, you know, were legit fighters with with schooling. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Uh, and you'll you'll see that there's a lot of actors and stuff, uh, singers that you know in their youth were boxers, and, and you learn about that kind of stuff. Um, it's it's very interesting. Okay, let's jump to um, one more call here. We're gonna get Thad on the line. Thad, what's up, brother? Hey, Mike. Great show. Great callers. Nostalgia with the Italian. So let me let me run this by you really quick. I missed like 15 minutes of the show. Um, Sugar Ray Robinson. He at least lost to two Italians that I know of. I don't know if he lost to Graziano. I I don't know offhand, but um, there's one guy he lost to at light heavyweight. Joey Maxim. Yeah. Joey Maxim was Italian, but he changed his name. He has a really long Italian last name. I mean, this guy's like Italian last name out of the wild zoo. So I don't know if you uh, you covered that. Joey Maxim. I don't know if I got Joey Maxim. For Italian? I got um, Joey Giardello. Okay. He beat. Right, another one. Yeah. Um, but now I don't. I don't know if I have Maxim on my list. That'd be another one I missed. Uh, maybe I do. Yeah, he yeah. he's the one who beat uh, Sugar Ray at light heavyweight in the uh, the heat. Sugar Ray was winning the fight, and then he got knocked out late. Maxim, uh, he he doesn't get the credit that he deserves. I believe he was a great light heavyweight. Giuseppe, but he was Antonio Italian. Just changed his name. Baradinelli. Yep. Yep. So uh, yeah, that, but that I like to learn new things in your article when I when I get to read it when I get the time. I'm gonna have fun with that. But uh, but like you said, Mike. My God, May to June 1st? Yeah. All right. I don't want to get explicit, but, you know, a boxing fan, I mean, it's better than sex, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Well, okay. So as a gambling yeah, guy, as a as a gambling guy, how are you managing that shit? Because you've got like four straight weeks Even of better. craziness. See, that's the thing. It's like March Madness. I stay away from March Madness. It's just too many games, too many. I don't I don't bet those, those games because the lines are they're just all over the place. Like boxing now in that month is going to be tough because you have so many fights, so many lines. You really got to do your due diligence, but I do like a lot of the, the picks there. And I think uh, Zile Zhang sends Deontay Wilder out on a gurney. Not to be disrespectful, but I think that's how it ends. Um, you're going to see some knockouts on these fight on these fight cards in, yeah. in May. And uh, the new Naoya Inouye, uh, that fight is going to be so underrated. I could see both guys hitting the deck. And, and just be a, 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 like a Hagler Hearns for yeah. the uh, the Bantams. So uh, there's just so much to go over. With it's gonna be hard to stick all of these. But this coming week, I'm a little upset because I had Sergei Bohachuk knocking off, you know, his opponent that got upgraded, Fundora. Stylistically, that was a match made in heaven for him. He was gonna knock him out. Unfortunately, now he's matched up with a guy with a chin that could take punches and give a punch. And I think Boha Chuk's going to get screwed. Mm. I think he's going to lose to Mendoza. Mm. Unfortunately, it's just styles. This guy could take a beating. You yeah. saw that with Zoo. Zoo just unloaded the kitchen sink on this guy. Unless this guy's broken, like uh, Joe Joyce was, you know, by Zhang. I, I just see Mendoza weather in the storm and getting to him. You know, sometimes when you hit a guy, hit a guy, hit a guy, he doesn't go, man. You're next. Yeah. Uh, same thing with Baldez. I think his time is past. I think he's chinny now. I think Liam uh, Liam stops him. He's a plus three hundred underdog. I mean, I wouldn't go crazy on that fight, but it's definitely circled. That's an upset possibility. One fight I, I'm perplexed on. I, I would put Sinicia Estrada minus five hundred, minus six hundred over the Costavai. I have no idea why that fight is close to a pick'em. Is it really? There has to be something there with, yeah, she she's just coming off a hand surgery. I think her hand's going to be a little bit healthier, you know, after surgery. And she's been fighting with the bum hand for like the last year and a half. Yeah. I don't think Yacosta Valle is anything special. I just think Sinesia just decisions her. But then again, in women's boxing, I've been taking it, taking on the chin with the Michaela Mayer fights and oh, yeah. some other weird decisions. Sandy Ryan and McCaskill. So you just never know with women's boxing because it always usually goes to the cards. I don't know, man. I, I want to lay a bomb on that one. Hmm. But again, I have to I have to wonder what the hell is up with that line. 
And, uh, of course, Tim Zhu and Fundora. Tim Zhu, if you're listening, you better knock this guy out. Because if it goes to the cards, they're going to screw you in Vegas. Bottom line, they're going to screw you. PBC wants Fundora to win this fight. I don't know if it was on purpose that this was all managed. Because Thurman, he was never going to fight this fight. I, I even said it. I, I, I made huge bets on uh, Zoo, which I'm unhappy that I have to collect on now that it was a push. Because the fight didn't go off. He was only like, minus, I got him at minus 800. I would have put it at minus 80,000. That's how big a favor he, he should have been. So now he's got to step up and fight a guy whose style is completely mirror opposite of, of Thurman. Right. Spells trouble, but the good news is Fandor is there to be knocked out. His style is made for a puncher, and uh, we'll see. But if that fight goes a decision, look out. Look out, because the robbery will be in, in play. <laughs> and Mike, uh, here's what I really wanted to ask you. Um, have you been watching this Andre Ward uh, saga going on? I mean, he's been interviewed everywhere. This guy's getting, you know, Every press clipping you can imagine because he wrote some goofy book. And it's kind of ironic because his fan base, like 90% of them are illiterate anyway. <laughs> you know, his fan base. So it's like counterintuitive unless he's got some kind of like speaking spell book. You know, like the kids used to Audio listen to. Like, or like a Teddy Ruxpin. Have, <laughs> Teddy Ruxpin. Yeah, have, have like Holy a teddy shit. bear, like tell the story. <laughs> yeah, put it in like Andre Ward teddy bear and he could, he could like tell his, his spiel to these idiots. Yeah, as it headbutts but, you and um, punches you in the nuts. <sighs> more or less he would slap you and run that would be the teddy bear he would like literally andre ward teddy bear would slap you and run <laughs> and then like he'll get like a mile away and say he like knocked you out yeah like that's andre ward in a, in a nutshell and i you know i talk down on some fighters like wilder i don't mind wilder wilder's all right you know it's his fans and his management that i didn't like all respect to wilder but andre ward i don't like that guy as a person i never met him but if I did, I'd tell him straight up face to face, he's a fraud and he, and he has issues, daddy issues. When he talks the way he talks and he contradicts himself and lies, that's a problem. He has to be called out. This guy's uh, like with Canelo. It's unbelievable. Like he used to talk about Golovkin. Now it's, now it's Canelo. Well, he's ducking this guy. He's ducking Benavides. He's doing this. Hey, Andre Ward, you duck Stevenson. You retired to avoid a Biterbiev that was your mandatory, a Bivol, a young Bivol that was your mandatory for the WBA. You avoided Lucien Boutte because you didn't want to go to Canada because you knew that bullshit that. style of yours wouldn't translate to that. Canada. He knew he couldn't get a decision because I remember the judges would have been like, yeah, this is garbage. Sergio Martinez's people were talking about doing a catchweight fight at like 164, 165, and Ward didn't want none of that. And yeah, there's a lot of fights that he of course just, not. yeah. <laughs> the biggest hypocrite, he ducked Stevenson at 68 and 75. Then he had the audacity, Mike, to say, well, Steve, that fight didn't make sense. So uh, Stevenson didn't earn it. He did say that. That would have been for undisputed. After he robbed Kovalev twice. Okay, none of those victories were legit. And he had the audacity to say Adonis Stevenson didn't, didn't earn that fight for undisputed. Where Stevenson, he was the that WBC title holder for what, seven years before Bozig fought him and put him in the hospital? Too, at one point, right? He was. Yeah. But it meant nothing, though, because he couldn't handle that southpaw style and the power. You know, he knew what was up. So uh, Vozig came down and took him out. What did, what did Ward do? Retired. Vozig would have smacked him around, too. So this guy's, you know, running his mouth. He's in the media saying, you know, all these, I don't know, ridiculous things. OK, he needs to be called out. He, someone needs to stand up to him in the media and say, Andre, you retired early because you're afraid to lose. You didn't want that L on your on your uh, your resume. You could tell us all you want, how you f wanted to fight Bell, you and, and, and uh, AJ. But you didn't. You didn't step up. You didn't you didn't move up. You didn't even move up against Chad Dawson, another right. light heavyweight. He's talked about fighting Anthony Joshua. That's hilarious. <laughs> like, who are we kidding here? Chad Dawson had to come down to 68. Yeah, Chad Dawson, you know, he said he could make the weight. And, but Andre Ward held him to that. He didn't want to fight him at 75 for the, uh, the belt. He made a fight at 68. The guy was literally walking to the ring like a cadaver. He went down like six times from a pillow fist, Andre Ward. And this guy has the audacity to lecture people and say, oh, yeah, I would have taken out AJ. 
get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so all you people that are entertaining this guy's uh, speak and spell book, good luck to you, man. You, you guys like must have maybe the lowest IQ on the face of the earth. If you believe one thing this guy says. So with that being said, Mike, you know, to, to all the fighters that are putting it on the line the next couple months, my God, thank you very much. We, the boxing fan base, appreciate it. We appreciate Turkey al Sheikh and his investors over in Saudi for putting up the money to put these shows on because this is the Lollapalooza of boxing all month. We are in a great place, but we're in a bad place when a guy like Andre Ward tries to steal the spotlight and lie and just deceive and, and make it a clown show and boxing now could attract new viewers with all these fights on free TV. We don't need Andre Ward mucking up the, uh, the pipes with his, with his sewer logic. So Mike, I'm going to let you go with that. I'd like okay. to hear what you have to respond to. Thanks man. That takes that. Guys, I'm going to make a bold prediction here. I don't think Fad likes Andre Ward. <laughs> it's just, it's just a, a gut feeling I have. It's just, uh, you know, a hunch. I don't think he likes Andre Ward. But um, Fad brought up Turkey Al Al Sheik. Um, I want to mention this. Um, I tweeted, I want to say it was maybe this weekend. And I'm not going to pull up the exact tweet. I don't want to go back digging for it. But um, I tweeted basically, I think I said, his excellency is saving boxing, right? And it was it was responding to the news that Wilder and Jang were going to fight on that Bivol Beater Biev card. And of course, that's because of Turkey Al Sheik putting up the money. Um, and then the other heavyweight fight that's under too, Hergovich Dubois. Don't sleep on that. It's a good fight. And so obviously, I was kind of half joking, but kind of not half joking. It was doing like a tongue in cheek, like <laughs> kind of thing. That's pretty much what X is. And pretty much every tweet that I post is kind of in that vibe. Um, but there's a couple of people out there that like took it seriously. And they're like, he's not saving boxing. He's, he's overpaying the fighters. And now they're going to have unreasonable purse ex expectations. And that's going to ruin the sport because it's not sustainable. I'm like, gee, that sounds familiar. Sounds like something I may have said once or twice over the last almost decade about certain platforms. Funny how uh, he didn't think they were ruining boxing. So look, in all seriousness, Turkey Al Al Sheikh is not going to save boxing. I don't mean that literally. Okay, use your critical thinking skills. I know that's difficult for some of you because you've been raised not to have any. But even if you went to American public school, uh, you still have some natural critical thinking ability up there. You just have to learn to develop it. Anyway, I don't think it's going to save boxing. Nothing can save boxing, right? Nothing can kill boxing. Nothing can save boxing. But if you look at the schedule over, you know, we're going to, to June 1st, but then you go back to the end of last year and the, that six month period pretty much. All the, not all, but most of the interesting fights that have been put together have been put together by this guy. And yes, is he overpaying the fighters? Yes, he's grossly overpaying them. Even star fighters like Anthony Joshua are being overpaid in these matchups. I don't give a shit. He's not a promoter. He's not an advisor. He's, think of him as like an event planner and he's a huge boxing fan, particularly heavyweights. And he's got billions of dollars and likes to spend it on bringing fights over there. These guys are all whores for the money. They call it prize fighting for a reason. So if they're throwing big money out, we're going to see some interesting fights. You guys telling me right now that you don't like Bivol, Beater, Bieb, Zhang, Wilder, Hergovich, Dubois? You don't like that? I, I read that shit and I got a hard on. I mean, how could you not if you're a fight fan? So His Excellency, I give you tremendous credit and thank you for doing what you're doing because um, you've made for some really fun, interesting events. Uh, 
so far in your time in the sport. And look, long term, obviously, this isn't something sustainable that's going to change the landscape of boxing for decades to come. But I do think it's indicative, again, of the globalization of boxing. But also, we're going to see, we will see more of these big fights over in different markets where huge sums of money are going to be put up. Uh, that's going to continue to happen. That's not going away, guys. So anyway, <clears throat> I want to end on that. Oh, one other thing. Ryan Garcia. Let's talk about him for a second. There's been um, a bunch of weird social media posts that um, Ryan Garcia has made, right? And a lot of people are talking about his mental health. And um, what are my thoughts on this? And I guess the New York Commission wants to have a mental health check to uh, make sure that, you know, he's mentally equipped to do this fight with Devin Haney. <sighs> I'm going to offend some of you out there. I know it. <laughs> but Ryan Garcia has always been kind of a weird guy. He's just a weird guy. Have you guys seen long form interviews with him? He was on the PBD podcast recently. And he just is socially kind of almost clueless and awkward at times. I have nothing against Ryan. I think he's a good guy. Okay. I'm not saying he's a bad person, but he's kind of odd. He's always just been a kind of odd. Tiafimo Lopez is another guy. It's just kind of odd, but Ryan Garcia is even more so. Do I think Ryan Garcia has some serious psychological issue and he's having a meltdown and he's going to, you know, um, break down in the fight and, and and walk out of the ring or something like Oliver McCall. Like, no, no, I really don't. If you look at all the weird social, social media posts that have been going on they're during the peak promotion weeks of their fight, they're promoting their fight. That's <laughs> in a few weeks. That's all I see it as. And I think Devin Haney and his team are not falling for any of it. Cause I think Ryan Garcia is trying to do this to maybe, get them to take him lightly and just throw him off. Um, and maybe I'll totally be proven wrong. Okay. Maybe Ryan Garcia will get in there and get knocked out in three rounds by Devin Haney, a guy who doesn't knock people out. And then I'll, I'll come back and say, yeah, man, there's something wrong with this dude. Cognitively, emotionally, there's something going on. But if this fight ends up being competitive and going to distance, even if Devin Haney wins, I think it's safe to say all this is just nonsense to promote the fight. Because why weren't these weird social media posts and all this stuff? And there's a lot been a lot of religious stuff and conspiracy theory stuff. Where was this before this fight announcement? Right? Where was all the weird social media posts then? It, what we got then was the typical shirtless hitting the, the the bag videos. Now you're getting all this these weird posts. So I think it's just part of the promotion of the fight. All right, guys. <clears throat> I enjoyed catching up with you. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Enjoy the rest of your week and we will catch up again soon as I can. All right. Thanks guys. Love yous. And I'll see yous at the fights.